Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting to order. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, my name is Marla Billinghurst. I'll be chairing the panel this afternoon. To my left is Mr. Kent Seelen, and to my far left is Mr. Maurice Terrien. Our assessor this afternoon is Mr. Matthew Barakas, and our recording secretary is Ms. Kelsey Harrison. <laughs> Coming. Yeah, that's why I was like, okay, <laughs> she, she was supposed to be here. Um, okay, we'll be hearing applications for revision of the assessment role in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application, and we will limit discussion to those matters. The statements that applicants or the assessor make at this hearing are sworn testimony, and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. Be advised that comparisons of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the Board of Revision. The Board of Revision is appointed annually by Council and is independent of it and the City Administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided at this hearing and issues a written order that will be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the Board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification, or to the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal, information on how to do so will be included with the Board's order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm the matters to be addressed with each applicant following the swearing in. We will then have the assessor's testimony, followed by questions that the applicant may have, and then the applicant's testimony, followed by questions. Each side will then have the opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence about an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave, and the process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard, and the board will deliberate in private and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. I will also ask that everyone please turn off their cell phones, and as information, all public hearings are live streamed, recorded, and will be part of the public record. Thank you. The first matter on the docket this afternoon will be 645 Spence Street. Could you please state your name? I'm Matthew Rogers. And do you intend to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Could you please state your name? Travis Huff. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please proceed when you are ready. Okay. Uh, file number 19-3334. Uh, roll number 1305-185500. Uh, 645 Spence Street, uh, owned by Manitoba Housing, uh, 2020 Rolly reference April 1st, 2018, assessed value of $2,891,000, uh, built in 83, we don't have an effective year built on it. Uh, last go around, uh, it was reduced at the Board of Revision from $2,715,000 to two million five hundred and ninety one thousand and they went with a five point five cap rate uh, that go around. Fifteen outdoor parking spots, thirty suites. Uh, if you go to page two you'll see that they've been they've been handing uh, the mailers in. Page three shows the income workup of thirty units. Sixteen two bedroom uh, 14 three bedroom for the 30 total units with an average monthly rent of $921.78. Uh, unless anything uh, has changed, the applicant and I are identical in terms of net operating income. So, uh, in regards to this property, uh, the difference would be the cap rate. So, I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, we have a 5% cap rate as per age and area, uh, as assigned by our model. Uh, so pages 4 and 4A are just rent comparables and CMAC uh, statistics, but because we agree on cap, I'm not going to go through. Or rather, we agree on NOI, I'm not going to go through. And page 4B, 
uh, just simply shows the chart that you've all seen before with this sample of actual sale that took place during the reference period, uh, not uh, property specific uh, as per usual, but they're just to illustrate, you'll see on the third table down that there are uh, cap rates within the city um, that support our cap rates uh, for the property. Uh, page five, uh, this is our typical capitalization uh, rate. Uh, second table that we always provide with our briefs. Uh, and then pages uh, seven and eight is the mailer. Uh, the mailer is property is uh, Mantle Housing. So it's uh, rent your income, ability to pay. Uh, they receive. Uh, subsidies to keep going. So uh, that's why I went to the market with the rents uh, and the expenses. So uh, again, we agree on that operating income. The last page in the brief is page nine, just showing in 2013 that uh, they did alterations to the exterior of the building to demolish and reconstruct the wood balconies. The construction uh, declared construction value uh, is $525,000. So uh, they spent a whole bunch of money uh, doing this work to the place. So they do uh, they do keep it up uh, from time to time. And there is money there to do large uh, capital projects like this uh, when necessary. So uh, again, just to summarize, with the $144,541 in operating income and our 5% cap as per age area and size, uh, generates a calculated value of $2,891,000. Thank you. Any Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, do you have any questions for the assessment? Uh, yeah, just, just a few. Um, looking at page number five and the capitalization rate, uh, table that uh, the city has there, the multifamily section. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that each of the, uh, that isn't really broken down by category. It's 4 to 7.3 is the overall range, and it's yep. just shown to be the same for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the, the, the entire range is 4 to 7.3 that the city has? Yeah, that's all over the city for all ages. So then when I flip to page 4B and we look at the multifamily cap rate sales that are shown there on the table as supportive data, they're, they're all under five. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that there's there's quite a number that are above five yeah. as well. Yeah, for sure. This is I just mean, a very small sampling. This is just a sampling. There's properties that sell for uh, cap rates that are higher than five. Okay. <clears throat> and I didn't bring this particular evidence as we do uh, so many, many, many of these hearings, and I've presented numerous times. Um, I'm assuming the city is aware that uh, 191 Roche and 394 Talbot uh, were purchased for renovation and were subsequently renovated, correct? Uh, I know that evidence they also, presented. for 191 Roche, uh, I believe they declared when they purchased it, they were declaring they purchased it based on a 5% cap rate. And I think they only, the sale price was 3610000 And I think they declared that they were going to spend 100000 So on a percentage basis, yeah, they were going to fix it up, but that's about 2.5% <clears throat> of what they actually So. Spent. If they were to invest all of that uh, money into, uh, let's say, kitchen cabinetry and uh, things of that nature, that would that would uh, have a significant impact on the rent, right? And that was a projected number, not a known after the renovation number that was at the time of sale, right? Are you talking about the cap rate? The hundred thousand that they. Oh, that's just what they declared on their uh, sales mailer. I mean, yeah, if they renovate the... So we don't yeah. really know what they spent on the, the property in the end. Afterwards? No, I don't have any exact plans. Okay. That's all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Terrian, do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, you, uh, have you inspected this building? I haven't been able to inspect any of the buildings on None? On the docket today, no. Okay. 
And uh, you said that the, I think I heard that the last decision came before the board. Yep. And it was a twenty-five ninety-one mm -hmm. and a five and a half cap rate. Yep, that's what they okay. uh, opted to. Okay. The uh, do you know what the condition of the building is? Uh, no, I have not inspected the property. Uh, Are there any notes that give you? Oh, in terms of the notes, I mean, I know they spent a bunch of money redoing the balconies. Yeah, the I saw that page. in the permit page nine. Uh, Twenty-five ninety-one. Like we have this lower down uh, inner model to try and reflect that it is social housing and typically it's more basic finishes. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that it's at uh, below average uh, to reflect that. Um, and that would be reflected in the, the model rents generated and uh, the overall uh, 55 uh, and a quarter percent expense ratio for the 1983 building. So you would have adjusted the uh, potential rent, uh, and um, but not necessarily the cap rate? Is that what you're saying? I'm trying to, uh, because sometimes it's a double whammy. Uh, when, it, when you adjust the rent and you don't adjust the cap or, or vice versa, sometimes we don't adjust up there and then you adjust the cap. So just trying to get a bit of a better handle on it. Yeah, we, uh, we lower the quality in our system so the model kicks out a higher expense ratio and uh, a lower uh, overall rent uh, to reflect that. You know, it is social housing, okay. it's, it's basic. Uh, okay. These places get well used, and so uh, that should be uh, considered. But uh, that's con that's considered and accounted for in the calculation of overall net operating income. Okay, and uh, this is you said age, area, and size is, yeah. is what really drives as well the cap. Uh, that's how the cap is assigned by the model. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we just did the balconies on the. Because I have read that demolish and reconstruct wood balcony. Do you know anything about the inside? Uh, well, I have not inspected it, and in terms of notes, we don't have any uh, recent inspections, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Hey, Mr. Seeland, do you have any questions? Just to confirm, the balconies were done in 2013. Uh, yes, uh, the the permit uh, was for. August of 2013, and then an exterior uh, inspection uh, was done to verify drive-by uh, January uh, 15th of 2014, and they were done. So, uh, that's excellent. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, thank you. I have no questions. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, as uh, as already indicated, this is a Manitoba housing uh, owned and operated uh, property. Um, just to, to start with, um, <clears throat> in the 2018 assessment cycle, I didn't represent this particular client. Uh, so the decision that uh, uh, occurred in 2018, I wasn't involved in. If they decided on a 5.5% cap, uh, I'm sure that's accurate. Uh, however, I was not. I was not uh, the agent in charge of representing the client at that time. I did review the results of that particular project from 2018, and there's a very wide uh, array of decisions that came out. Some of them were at 6.5%, some of them were at 5.5%, and uh, in, in between, obviously. So this particular one happened at 55 I gather, uh, but I wouldn't place any great reliance on that. Um, in the two cycles previous to that, I did represent the client, and uh, we do have <coughs> we do have uh, a significant number. Uh, well, our our results generally indicated six percent and above as far as cap rates at the, uh, at that time, um, and uh, we have a significant number uh, that didn't reflect that. Uh, well, not a significant number. A number that didn't reflect that that had been further appealed to the municipal board and are awaiting scheduling. So I wouldn't again place a great reliance on what the decision was in the last uh, particular cycle for this individual property. Um, moving on to uh, the subject property itself and our hearing overall, we're looking uh, almost entirely at Manitoba housing properties today, so I'll kind of run through a, a quick 
quick uh, <clears throat> overview uh, of uh, the modeling for that and, uh, and how we've done it um, or how we've reviewed it in order to determine uh, fair market value. So as already indicated, uh, in Manitoba housing properties, they're operated on a rent geared to income basis. So there is no existing in place market rental rates and income stream that one can accurately rely upon in order to project a fair market value. It will, would always be too low in order to project a, a fair, a fair uh, assessment for the property. It would undervalue it significantly. So we need to go to the market to look at what uh, fair market value is. Now, the condition of these properties, uh, whether they're newer or older, generally tends to be uh, on the below average side, um, which is certainly fair in the properties that we're looking at today. Um, this particular property built in 83, it hasn't had renovations since that time. Yes, the balconies deteriorated to a point where they needed replacement. Um, so you have uh, new balcony structures because they're falling apart. Um, however, balconies are not a huge driver of revenue for these properties. And if you, <coughs> if you uh, look at uh, the main pieces where one would invest money into a property to uh, generate revenue, it would be your kitchens and bathrooms and flooring, the typical things that uh, apartment owners uh, invest money into in order to drive revenue for their properties. Now, the subject, I have uh, photographs beginning on page number four. You can see the new support structures and balconies on the exterior there. So yes, indeed, that did happen in 2013. <coughs> the uh, units themselves are shown beginning on page five through seven. The overall comment with regard to Manitoba housing is that the, uh, their mandate, of course, is to house lower income uh, residents of Winnipeg and Manitoba um, in uh, affordable accommodation. So they seek to uh, accommodate as many people in as little space as they can in order to maximize the number of people that they can have uh, housed in the, the land that they have available to them. So the bedrooms tend to be on the smaller side. The finishes are of a very basic serviceable level and uh, they do tend to, as uh, the city had indicated, receive more wear and tear than a typical market apartment out there. So they tend to be in below average condition. So you can see the basic nature of the accommodations in the photos here. It was built in 83, so the cabinetry, etc., is indicative of that time. You have the tile flooring on the bottom and obviously you can see the wear and tear of the, the property itself. Now, <clears throat> locationally, uh, you can see the site uh, aerial on page number eight, giving you the outline of the site itself. It's at the corner of, uh, sorry, corner of Spence and Notre Dame in the West End, uh, Spence neighborhood. Uh, just west of uh, Isabel there, I guess it is. So um, we're all longtime Winnipeggers, I'm assuming. We're all familiar with the West End area and uh, the social and economic challenges that are present there. That's where these properties are by and large located today. <coughs> the analysis, looking at uh, the market value for the property, so uh, these are somewhat unique in that we can't rely, obviously, upon uh, any in-place income as they're all based on uh, the, uh, the rental rate. Internal rents are based on uh, the, the income of the individual uh, occupants of the, the units. So the, as low-income residents, obviously, the rent that they pay is uh, well below market. So we yeah, don't place any reliance on that, so we need to look at market. What we did is look both at uh, CMHC averages, um, which uh, tend to skew high in this, in this uh, particular area, uh, given the large area that it covers, and we looked at uh, the values that the city had come up with as well in relation to the size, condition uh, of the units and location and what, what we felt uh, would be a fair assessment of rental level. So in looking at 
The subject property, we have 16 two-bedroom units and 14 three-bedroom units. Um, looking at uh, their location, et cetera, we were in agreement with the city uh, at a rental level of $922 on average per month for uh, the property. So we, <clears throat> we have used the same gross rental revenue. Um, vacancy, uh, we are in agreement at 2.6% based on market stats. And looking at the expense side of the equation, um, as is typical with these properties, their expenses do tend to be higher than, uh, than a normal market uh, apartment. So if you look at my page number 13, we've done a three, years, <coughs> three year uh, history of the expenses for the property as well as stabilization for um, the valuation date uh, decreasing the R&M that we spent on it uh, and instituting a, a property management amount, which they don't account for. Come, our stabilized amount came out to $203,391. For the subject year, um, this uh, is uh, significantly higher than uh, uh, what would produce a fair value for the property just based on um, uh, the percentage uh, that that expense allowance would produce. So in this instance, we deferred to the City of Winnipeg's expense allowance percentage and applied that to the rent. So we are matching them in the expense allowance and we arrive ultimately at the same net operating income. Once checking everything against the performance of the property itself on the expense side, as well as uh, the market itself. So that, Overall <coughs> modeling is how we approach each of these properties uh, today on uh, the Manitoba housing ones. So as indicated, uh, capitalization rate is where we differ. So um, I haven't necessarily presented uh, this material before all of you. I will do this only once today and then we can move quickly on to the other ones as I know the number to cover here. Essentially, in looking at uh, public and social housing, uh, coming up with market value is difficult based on a number of factors. They don't tend to transact often in the market, and when they do, they're not based on any in-place uh, income and expense revenue typically. Often it's a transfer from one agency to another or a property that's sold for a different use. So there are no capitalization rates out there in which to uh, frame uh, an appropriate cap rate based on other social housing transactions. Looking at uh, my page number 14, um, uh, comparing uh, social and affordable housing uh, properties directly to standard market apartment transactions uh, it is not, uh, is not uh, uh, it's not apples to apples, it's not a direct comparison. Uh, social housing properties have considerable restrictions and burdens that are not present for market apartments. These include uh, rental market, or rather rental income <coughs> restrictions, obviously the rent is restricted on the properties. Rental market restrictions, that being the smaller pool of potential tenants, you're serving a particular mandate, so you have a smaller group that uh, is uh, accommodated there. Generally, you have higher operating expenses for these properties. <coughs> the physical condition, as noted, often tends to be uh, below average, and certainly that is the case uh, with what we'll be looking at today. And then finally, uh, you are also looking at disposition restrictions as well. You have uh, a number of a number of issues that would be present upon uh, the sale of the property. Uh, first and foremost being that you have residents, uh, occupants, tenants that are in place on, on a legal basis uh, that are entitled to uh, remain in place uh, going forward under their uh, existing uh, structure, at least for a certain period of time. So <clears throat> that uh, that's kind of the background. There is a particular uh, appraiser, Mr. Richard Poulton, who is an expert in social housing, the valuation of such, 
and public housing. He's an accredited appraiser out of the United States, equal to uh, the same designation in Canada. And he's written a book uh, entitled Valuation and Market Studies for Affordable Housing. And I'll just quickly quote from this. <coughs> he, in this book, states, Developing a market-derived capitalization rate for an income-restricted property begins with an analysis of the available rates for similar unrestricted properties. Then, then these rates are adjusted based on the risk factors that an investor would consider in developing a capitalization rate. The result is a capitalization rate based on market factors and associated risks. In the final analysis, property tax assessment must take into account the public purpose of the project, the overall benefits and burdens, and the restricted nature of the operating rents. So, Essentially, uh, what, uh, what's being stated is you need to look at market transactions and then look at the additional uh, complicating factors and additional risk factors that are present for any purchase of a public and or social housing property on the market for the property as it sits at that time. So <clears throat> if you were to, and the, the best way to summarize this essentially is to say, uh, if you are an investor on the marketplace and you have standard market apartment A on one side of the road and on the opposite side of the road the identical property uh, stand, but it's a uh, social and or public housing property, <clears throat> there are additional risks that you're taking on in the purchase of that property that would cause you to uh, pay less for the property, which obviously changes the capitalization rate in, a, in an upward direction. So that's, that's the uh, basis of uh, the determination of the <coughs> capitalization rate in, this, in the first place. So where do we go from there? We look at <coughs> market transactions that have occurred. We look at uh, industry information with regard to uh, capitalization rates for the multifamily sector in the relevant time frames, and then we make uh, an appropriate uh, uh, decision with regard to capitalization rate for the individual properties. So on page number 14, <clears throat> we have included uh, six capitalization rates for properties that transacted uh, between 2015 and 2018. They are not all uh, specifically in the area of each of these subjects, nor are they all of the same size or of the same vintage, etc. What uh, this chart shows you is essentially the range of capitalization rates, the general range of capitalization rates that uh, investors are paying in the marketplace. From uh, the bottom end towards the top end, there are obviously variations on either side but this is a pretty good indicator of the range that's being paid out there. These are astute investors buying properties based on the in-place net operating income. Each of these properties uh, was purchased for the in-place income. There was no upside on these. They couldn't renovate and increase their, their return on the properties. What they were buying was what existed at the time, so they're true cap rates. So we have a range of between 5.44% up to 6.65%. The low end of that is the triple three ward sale in 2016, the most recent uh, property uh, in terms of age built in 2006 and the largest property at 103 units. That uh, is certainly uh, uh, one, if not the most uh, premier property that's traded in the city in, uh, in recent times uh, with publicly available information. There's obviously different information has come out on this uh, from various sides. The actual purchase price paid was $18 million. Based on the in-place income and expense, the cap rate was 5.25%, essentially agreed both by the city as well as uh, the appellant. The 5.44% represents what the purchaser uh, bought the property on the basis of, in that they recognized that there were expenses that were included there that they could create efficiencies on, and they subsequently did so following their purchase of that property. So that is the background there. <coughs> the other properties uh, have been renovated, so they're not 
original to the 1928 or 1929 or 51 dates. They've all been updated and uh, had no further no further uh, opportunity uh, for lift with regard to return for those properties. As pointed out, property is in the West End area. This is an area of obviously lesser interest to investors due to social and economic issues. You get greater tenant turnover, greater degrees of bad debt, and generally significantly increased repair and maintenance costs. Uh, I do represent other landlords in that area, and they have, uh, uh, yeah, they have their challenges with regard to properties in this area, certainly. Moving on from there, we look at uh, the market participants themselves. So we look at two of the main commercial real estate brokerages who participate in the sale of multifamily apartments. Looking at the Collier's information on page 15, we have both the 2016 and 2018 uh, Collier's cap rate reports. If you look at the Winnipeg section of these, you can see a fairly static number, low rises ranging between five and a quarter and six percent in the Winnipeg region in 2016 and five and six percent in 2018. Um, the <coughs> CB Richard Ellis information on the following page breaks it down slightly further. If you look at the low rises in the Winnipeg category in the 2016 chart, you have 5.5 to 6 for low rise A, 5.75 to 6 for low rise B. Certainly, uh, Manitoba housing properties would fall into the low rise B uh, category at the upper end of what one might consider them. Um, 2018, the figures are exactly the same 5.5 to 6 percent, 5.75 to 6. CB Richard Ellis also gave a timeline with regard to cap rates in Winnipeg and if you look at the chart in the bottom of page number 16 and the lowest line there indicating multifamily transactions you can see that capitalization rates have essentially remained static between that 2014 time frame up to the valuation date of Q1 uh, 2018 with uh, a stable trend there. So. The two brokerages uh, with regard to cap rates for multifamily, they're looking at investment grade properties in coming up with these, uh, these ranges. They're looking at the data that they have and they're asking their investors, etc., uh, with regard to uh, cap rates. And this is what they are seeing in the marketplace for investment grade properties. Now, what we are dealing with is not uh, in that range. So at a bare minimum, bare minimum, we're going to be at the top end of that range with regard to uh, the properties that we're looking at today based on, based on what they are <coughs> and uh, where they're located, etc. So the upper end of that range is 6%. That's essentially our starting point. And if you look at my page number 17, uh, there's a little bit more text here with regard to cap rates, uh, giving you an idea of the things that we take into account. We look at location, uniqueness of the rental property, rental income restrictions, uh, the, obviously the smaller pool of tenants, additional operating expenses as shown for the subject, Physical condition, as you can see for the subject as well, generally there is often more deferred maintenance in these as well. Um, as a non-profit, there is no reserve fund, well, non-profit uh, government agency, there is no specific reserve fund set aside to cover any deferred maintenance and or capital needed. And then you face disposition restrictions upon sale as well. So. Obviously, any prudent purchaser, uh, well-informed, is going to apply uh, uh, an increased risk assessment to these properties in the purchase, and that will be reflected in a higher capitalization rate. So, for the subject property, <coughs> it is uh, somewhat conventional in terms of its uh, unit count. They're not all one and two bedrooms, but significant number of them are twos, 16 of them. Then we have 14 uh, three-bedroom units. Uh, 
have. So less demand for three bedrooms, but uh, it's you know they're not four and five bedrooms and uh, a lot of them. There is a total of 30 units, so it's not huge. It's on the on the smaller side. It was built in '83. Um, and while it's below, in below average condition, in my uh, in my view, um, it is more recent than uh, some of the other ones. So we've applied a cap rate of six percent to this property. And if you apply that to the NOI, our market value that is derived is two million four hundred nine thousand, as shown on page seventeen. We have our valuation of the property compared to the city's valuation summarized in a chart for you there on page 17. Now, the addendum materials for this property and the others today include the income and expense from the clients, the various uh, brokerage houses uh, capitalization rate reports as quoted in the brief, as well as <coughs> decisions taken in the 2020 cycle with regard to other <coughs> Manitoba housing properties uh, uh, that have been under appeal for, uh, for the 2020 assessment cycle. Now, I haven't included everything. There are some uh, that, well, we have well over 100 of these that we've done, so I'm not including all of them, but generally the capitalization rates are uh, as shown in the uh, agenda materials here. That is my presentation, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, on page six, So, trying to get a handle on what the kitchen and bathroom looks like, but it's uh, it's hard to tell. Um, no, I don't. Maybe, maybe I'll out with that. <laughs> uh, the pictures, it's hard to tell. Um, are those newer countertops and newer cabinets in there? Because I've seen some countertops in other Manitoba housings that, are they green? Are they the same color as they use in other ones that they've replaced? There's a variety, uh, and they, <coughs> they have... Um, they go through changes in the, the standard in terms of what, what materials they use in these. Um, I don't specifically recall which ones, which ones these are. Dominantly, the, uh, the uh, cabinetry, etc. was original. Um, being Manitoba housing, they do get more damage, physical damage, than a typical apartment. So when that happens, they have to replace them. But uh, what I would tell you is that uh, it is dominantly original from uh, what I recall of this property and in below average condition. So that would be like the, the cabinets as well, including uh, the vanity in the bathroom. Would, would the vanity in the bathroom be uh, comparable to the kitchen cabinets? Would it be the same? It should be a little similar vintage, yeah, built in 83. Okay. Um, okay. So, and because we're on cap rate uh, mostly, I'm going to flip to page 14. Um, so, you mentioned a book um, by Richard Colton, MAI. That's not a Canadian designation, is it? No, it's the equivalent designation in the states uh, by their governing body in the United States, and there's a, there's a process by which an AACI designated appraiser in Canada can become an MAI and, and vice versa. It's essentially the same, and uh, the theory that is studied by both is uh, is the same. So, so when he did his study in his book. Uh, valuation market states for affordable housing. Uh, was it all based in the United States? So this this point has come up a number of times before in uh, hearings, and uh, I guess my comment with regard to that would be that we're looking at the theory of the determination of market value for <coughs> social uh, and public housing. Uh, not 
about the specifics of whether it's in Maryland or, or Manitoba, essentially. It's the theory behind how they should be approached in uh, the determination of market value. So it's all based in the States, basically? He is a United States-based Okay, correct. So he did his research in the States. Might there be different rules for transactions in the States than so, in our country? Absolutely, there's different rules between the United States and, uh, and here. And what, what I would say again is that we're not looking at the specifics of what the taxation regime or assessment is in Utah versus uh, BC. It's it's the theory behind uh, the, mo the modeling and approach of how these properties should be uh, valued and how determining an appropriate capitalization rate would be done. And that's not going to be different whether it's in the United States or Canada. Uh, for Triple Three Ward, we've talked about this a uh, hundred times. Yeah. Um, you're, are you aware that Altus prov has provided a breakdown showing a 5.1% cap rate uh, in their study? I'll be quiet. Yes, indeed, I am aware that they have presented that. Um, <coughs> the owner's agent, uh, as well as Mr. Lucky, who I was here with yesterday, uh, both uh, presented uh, essentially the same information that that uh, the capitalization based on in-place income and expense, net operating income at the time of sale, would point towards a five and a quarter percent cap rate. The 5.44%, as sworn by an affidavit by the purchaser, is based on their knowledge that the expenses for the property were too high and they could adjust them, which they subsequently did after buying the property. So that is what the difference is there. Okay. Uh, page uh, 16, you've got a chart here. This, uh, you, you've got Cap rate survey 2016, 2018. Uh, this chart, though, this is just from 2016, though, right? Do you have the 2018 one? The 2018 one is the bottom left-hand corner. Oh, okay. It doesn't say 2018, but that's what it is. I wanted to fit it on the same page. Oh, okay, okay. And then for uh, page 17. Um, in the middle of the large paragraph. Uh, deferred maintenance and a lack of uh, reserve fund. I mean, based on uh, the large permit that was taken out in excess of half a million dollars, um, and we've we've had other properties where you know they tend to wait till they go down a bit and then they take a big permit out and then they redo them. Um, might that uh, comment uh, that there's a lack of reserve fund be? Uh, inaccurate uh, given uh, Manitoba House is a Crown Corporation and they've got access. Uh, so I, I wouldn't uh, certainly term it as inaccurate and perhaps I should have explained more thoroughly except I realize I take a lot of time when I present these initially so I gloss over some things perhaps. The, as a public entity and a non, you know, non-profit, uh, essentially social housing, uh, they're operated on a meant to break even, essentially. So when you have a uh, circumstance such as that, there is no profit motive, so there is no, there is no uh, profit to set aside for uh, a reserve fund. So that is what is being pointed out there. There's no additional revenue. With regard to the deferred maintenance and the maintenance of the property, so Manitoba Housing, obviously, very large uh, government entity. They have, I couldn't tell you how many properties. I'm going to say it's uh, probably in the neighborhood of 600 in the city, something such as that. The, <clears throat> um, uh, the gov they obviously receive funding uh, from the government on an annual basis. They have a uh, process by which they go through to uh, determine their budget for the corporation <coughs> overall, what is assigned for uh, capital replacement, etc. And then they look at their uh, <coughs> they look at their portfolio and those properties that are most in need of maintenance. Now, given the public that they serve and the market segment that they serve, the wear and tear is is very large on these properties, and uh, <coughs> they tend to break down quicker. Um, and it tend, being such a large number, 
of properties and the variability of funding, they do tend to deteriorate. So that's essentially what's being indicated there. Not that there is no money available ever. There is. They spent 500000 on replacing balconies here. But by and large, you're going to have properties that have greater deferred maintenance and, and lower condition. So and just in regards to your agenda here, you've got some, you got a bunch of decisions uh, with six cap on them. I mean, we've had a couple hearings together with some other housing <coughs> ones that they go with sometimes 5.3, five and a half. So, I mean, this is not, just the agenda, like I didn't bring uh, orders myself, I brought orders myself, but would yeah. you agree that there's other Manitoba housing decisions whereby they, they've gone with uh, five point something cap. Absolutely, yes. And uh, the intent is not to say that there weren't other decisions. Certainly, uh, there have been some that we were in disagreement with uh, that were lower, and we've appealed those to the municipal board, and we await scheduling of those at a later date. Um, so, yes, there have been certainly others. And I didn't by any means bring all of the ones that we've yeah, we had ourselves. This is racing. <laughs> it's more of a, you know, this is the the viewpoint that we're essentially seeing. Okay. That's just the point. Um, all right. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Terrier? Did you inspect uh, this property? Uh, I will say that we inspected this property. Our company did. I did not visit this particular property myself, but we did take the photographs that you see there. Is that recent? It's the summer. The summer? And uh, I don't want to ask the question again. Have you inspected any of the properties we're going to look at today? Uh, yes, but I would have to look at okay. each of them as we okay. go forward. I, because sometimes the answer is yes or no. So. We had roughly 130 properties to review in a short, yeah. very short window. So I didn't okay. See uh, yeah, I looked at the uh, at you, the decisions as well, and I see there's a lot of co-ops in there versus MHRC. Now what is, how different would you look at those? Because what you've done as well, because I know that we get arguments about site specific all the time. Mm -hmm. And I see you've, uh, there's been adjustments on the income. Um, and in this case here, you've just accepted what the city come up with. I'm assuming you must have, you must have crunched some figures to see if the city's NOI was okay. Uh, but we don't get that evidence. We just we just say that's okay. But you've done it uh, in a number of cases here. No, let me finish. Absolutely. Um, but a number of cases here, I see you brought figures in mm -hmm. on the income, and it's, so is co-op housing the same as as MHRC stuff? Because it's, it's a combination of all these different things that we're supposed to look at here to see what is fair? Absolutely, and that, that is what we want to arrive at in the end, right? So for Manitoba housing owned and operated properties, we don't rely at all on the rent gear to income income that they generate. So if you look at the addendum materials, the actual IME will be in there, and it will show you that they generated $201,000 essentially for the subject property versus the 331 332,000 that's being projected for it. Um, looking at uh, these Manitoba housing properties, and I, I grant you that you know it, it would be lovely if there was revenue there that we could rely upon and uh, make some judgment on as to whether it's fair or not. Uh, it's not in place in that way. So what we have to do is look at uh, market evidence. So we've provided uh, CMHC averages uh, on page number 11. Uh, they're not always appropriate for these properties. Certainly, if you look at uh, the location of some of these, they'll fall within larger regions that will say the average rent should be significantly higher based on all of the nicer properties that are in that area. Um, the other thing to consider, as mentioned by the city, and we're in agreement with this, is that these properties are below average in terms of condition, size, uh, etc. And so that is what's driving the rent. So we looked at <clears throat> we looked at the rental averages that uh, the city has used, the suite mix, the size of those, 
and, uh, and market evidence in order to see is that a fair assessment of what these will generate because there's nothing to compare it to. Um, we feel that it is. So I, it's not simply a matter of saying that's, that's fine. We looked at them and if it was appropriate, we would go with them. Uh, any difference between the co-ops and the MHRC uh, deals? Because obviously you've tried to, uh, you, you've adjusted some of them. I don't know if you've adjusted cap rates on those as well, so I don't know. I, the cooperative, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the cooperative was, properties. Uh, because you've got them in there, sorry. so I just wondered, uh, there's a reason why you put them there. Uh, the cooperative properties are uh, are different, obviously, than public-owned properties, but they are social housing, essentially, and non-profit as well, but uh, generally in uh, better condition, uh, and their rents are not uh, of the same low low level that you would have them out of the housing. So they are they are different. Uh, there are adjustments to cap rates in those two. The and I, I, sorry, perhaps I should include all of the decisions for the Manitoba no, housing. No, but I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a handle of why you've got both. That's all. So uh, it was more that they were in the same sphere as not being uh, standard market apartments uh, in being presented. Now, there's a couple there that are, are cooperatives. Certainly, if you look more towards, I think I've got 130 Tuxedo there at the front which is a uh, Manitoba housing Sorry. property. I, I'm just going to interrupt for a minute because we, we don't actually look at other decisions That's from true. other properties because we're, we're not bound by by those decisions. Right. Generally, we don't, uh, we don't look Understood. at <laughs> No, the point was, though, that yeah. it's brought in as evidence that they're, I want to see if they're different, and he's a, I think he's tried to answer that. Mm -hmm. Social housing as well. So that's yes, why they that's the intent. So it's not that I'm looking at those decisions. It's, it's got this as a, as backup information. Mm -hmm. My last question is: You talked about uh, the turtle. Uh, is there a vacancy in this building at all? Do you know? They, as with uh, all multifamily properties, they do have tenants that uh, that come and go or have to be evicted uh, or damage that occurs in suites. So yes, they do have vacancy that occurs. That's pretty much in keeping with uh, the marketplace itself. Okay, that's all, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you very much. Mr. Sealand, do you have any questions? Sure, a question with page 11. Mm -hmm. You have a chart, which is 1.1.2. The chart has a total, it has actually one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. Mm -hmm. Plus, is the total an average, or what does the total represent? So on page 11, that chart at the bottom there, uh, this is the Canada Mortgage and Housing uh, <clears throat> Corporation's Fall 2017 Rental Market Report. So they break it down by area. So you've got your area on the left-hand side there. And then they <clears throat> break it down by uh, unit type, so bachelor three, three plus bedrooms. And each of those numbers is uh, the average for that area for that unit type. So if you look at, say, Fort Rouge, and <clears throat> bachelor units, the average range there would be 647 for a bachelor unit in, in that area for that October 2017 study. Okay, we'll get the total. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, so I have the page. Um, what is the total? Is it uh, is an average of one bachelor, one bedroom, two bedroom, three plus? Or yeah. What is the total? That is uh, as the overall average rent in the area of all unit types. So it's it's not a it's not a great uh, figure with regard with regards to reliability for any particular. It's just an overall average. Okay. Um, you mentioned that um, three bedroom apartments weren't quite as um, um, as uh, perhaps attractive or rentable. Is, is a, a high degree of that compared to the two bedroom suite? They're, they're less in demand in the marketplace, which is evidenced by uh, there being less of them out there, less of them constructed, certainly, uh, both 
both uh, back in time frames when more apartments were being built in the, in the 70s, etc. And we're now going through new construction uh, phase where uh, new apartments are being built and generally there are ones and twos too, with some exceptions where you'll see some threes, but by and large there are fewer of them because there's lower demand for them. Um, and I think if you look at uh, the, the statistics with regard to vacancy for them tend to be less reliable because there's fewer units out there, but uh, vacancy does tend to be higher for those three plus bedroom units. Uh, now, as Manitoba Housing, the mandate of them is to accommodate uh, those in need, so it's your you know single occupants, bachelor units often, uh, as well as families, so you get the three, four, and five bedroom units, which you just don't see on the marketplace. They build them because that's their mandate, or built them rather. Um, but in the marketplace, uh, there is significantly less demand out there for that, those unit types. Thank you. You're welcome. And I have no questions. Thank you very much. Take a quick recess right now, then. Right, I will call this meeting back to order. I will now proceed with 757 Furby Street. Uh, Mr. Brockett, please proceed when you are ready. Okay, file number 19 1745, or number 1306170000, uh, 757 Furby Street. Manitoba Housing is the owner again. Uh, 2020 assessment, uh, one million four hundred fifty-nine thousand. It's an apartment. Uh, not too far from the area we're talking about. This one's Furby and Notre Dame, 1983. Uh, 16 suites, five outdoor parking spots. Uh, last time around, it was reduced from one million five hundred ninety-two thousand to one million four hundred and thirty-four thousand. And they use a five and a half cap rate on that. So, uh, just like the other one, uh, we are the same in terms of net operating income, and the difference is uh, in capitalization rate. Uh, we're at five on this one as per age area and size. Uh, page three just shows the breakdown eight two bedroom units, eight three bedroom units, 16 total units. Uh, 72,957 cap to 5% comes up with the 1,459,000, which is uh, very highly similar to what it was in 2018, reduced to 1,454,000. Uh, because we are the same in terms of net operating income, I'm not going to really write the parables or the income expense side of the coin. Cap to 5 as per age area and size. Uh, the last page uh, shows a uh, permit. Uh, they, they, they declared $265,000 uh, worth of exterior alterations, uh, demolishing, and again, reconstructing wood balconies. Maybe they got a deal. Um, so, 5% cap, uh, we're at $1,459,000. Um, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, do you have any questions? Uh, I really have no, no questions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Terrier. Yeah, just a quick one. Why are you using 3% vacancy and the last one was 2.60? So is it because there's less uh, suites, less units? I'm not sure. That might be the case. Um, Because you said it's basically the same area, same year, same year. And right. I'm yeah. Wondering. I'm not sure. I would have thought that would have sure? been. I would, have, I would have thought they would have been the same, but I don't have the answer. Okay. Thank you. That's all, Madam Chair. Mr. Steven. Mm 
and so the evaluation for that was just to replace the wood companies? Yeah, it says that uh, demolishing and re reconstructing the wood balconies on the exterior. Thank you. Just like that. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on Mr. Terry's question, so uh, it's model generated? It's all model generated. Okay. Thank you. That was my only question. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, please proceed when you are ready. Yes, thank you. So we're dealing again with uh, 757 Burby Street, uh, Manitoba Housing, owned and operated property. <clears throat> As with uh, the last property, I will again point out that I was not involved in the last appeal in the 2018 cycle, so I did not necessarily put a great deal of reliance on the decision that came out there at 5.5%. Again, we looked at uh, the overall breadth of uh, decisions that uh, happened uh, with regard to the Manitoba housing portfolio in the last cycle. And it obviously depended on uh, the uh, person presenting uh, as well as you know, other factors. In any case, that is the background with regard to the 2018 cycle. Looking at uh, the subject property itself, this one built in the same time frame, 1983, in the similar area. Uh, we are on Furby Street here <coughs> at the corner of Notre Dame. The subject property has 16 units, and in this case, we are looking at uh, seven <coughs> three-bedroom units. So you have one two-bedroom, eight uh, <clears throat> one one bedroom rather, eight two bedrooms and uh, seven three bedroom units for a total of uh, 16 units here. With regard to the building condition, it's an interesting one uh, in that we have 16 units. They have had renovations that have been done to uh, four out of the 16. Uh, so 25% of the building where they invested some money into uh, cabinetry, uh, flooring, etc. Uh, the balance of it has not been done. Um, it's not scheduled to be done. And uh, the difference between them is stark between uh, the units that uh, have been done and those that haven't. Now, uh, the thing to keep in mind as well is that uh, when these units go through what Manitoba Housing calls the refresh process, so they where they put in new finishes, new flooring, etc. They don't necessarily stay that way. Um, you get the same uh, the same uh, residents being housed there, and the same level of uh, wear and tear, etc., that occurs given uh, the issues that uh, many of these families face, etc. The wear and tear is greater, and they don't last. So, a renovation that occurs here uh, is not necessarily going to. Uh, carry forward and have the same value that one would expect in a, a standard market apartment. Nevertheless, uh, they had renovated four out of the 16 units here. Um, the photos of the property begin on page number four, exteriors, then we move into the interior. <clears throat> you can see, if you look closely at the bottom of page four, the tile flooring for these units, again, you walk into a standard market apartment, this is not the flooring that you're going to be looking at, uh, the level of finish in, uh, in those. Cabinetry is original to that date, as well as bathrooms, etc. So that's the property that we're looking at. Again, we're located on Furby in the West End. <clears throat> looking at the valuation itself, I too will not spend a lot of time on uh, arriving at the net operating income, suffice it to say, we did look at uh, the income level assigned to it versus uh, the market. We looked at vacancy, we looked at the expenses, and we felt that these were fair indicators of uh, value for the subject property. So we are in agreement on the net operating income. With regard to the vacancy, as that's a question that came up, I would just point you to page number 11. And uh, if you look at the subject area, so we're looking, I mean, Furby is an interesting, I believe we're falling into Midland in Furby. Um, so you'd be looking at 
uh, one bedrooms at 3.5 percent, two bedrooms at 5.2, and then not enough data for three bedroom units uh, to assign a vacancy. So the three percent vacancy is certainly uh, supported by the market evidence, which is why we're in agreement with it. Moving on to the capitalization rate, uh, we have uh, a somewhat smaller project here at 16 units, built in 1983, as already stated. Um, so those are uh, those are positives in terms of uh, the capitalization rate. Balancing that, we're located in the West End on Fergie Street, and uh, the units uh, are in the condition that they are, with uh, the exception of the four, which is a somewhat. Uh, somewhat temporary state. Um, the uh, remainder of the factors we've already discussed uh, fairly extensively, so uh, being on the smaller side, uh, having the one and two bedroom units, uh, etc., uh, we felt that a 6% a cap rate at the low end of what we would assign to these properties uh, is fair and representative for the subject. So using that 6% cap gives us a market value of 1216000 which you can see on my page number 15 where we have the comparison chart of our analysis versus the City of Winnipeg's analysis. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Brockes, any questions? For Mr. I just have my questions in regards to cap be considered. Absolutely. Mr. Terrian? Mine as well. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Seelan? I just want to get the issue is actually one one bedroom apartment here because the city's documentation says there's uh, 82 bedrooms and uh, you have one one bedroom and seven two bedrooms. Yes. And so <clears throat> the uh, the split that we have here is taken directly from the property manager from for the property. Okay. So this is what is present on the, on the site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would also say that my questions be taken into account. I won't ask them twice. Absolutely. All right. The next property to be dealing with is 62 Isabel Street. And please proceed when you are ready. Uh, 62 uh, Isabel Street, phone number 19-1751. I roll number 1306129800. Uh, again, MHRC uh, 482,000 uh, for only assessed value on, on this property. Uh, it's a 1978 uh, six suites, uh, two outdoor parking spots, uh, construction class two water steel frame walls. Um, page three, you'll see our breakdown uh, on the property. Uh, so six two bedroom units. Uh, we only have to rent at six hundred and eighty-two uh, dollars. Uh, as for age area and size, the model is assigned a four point four uh, cap rate to it. Uh, generate the value of four hundred and eighty-two thousand. Uh, last time <coughs> the border revision it was are reduced from 466000 to 445000 and they used a five and a half cap uh, on that one. So uh, it was quite a, well it's a full point uh, lower in terms of the cap rate, but if we're looking at the overall value, I don't know what the net operating income was assigned uh, for that one. Uh, we're looking at, you know, less than $40,000 on the increase uh, of it. So looking at the overall value, it looks like our value is in line with what the previous decision was. So for this one, we 
again, mental housing, we agree on net operating income of uh, 21,222. We differ on cap rate. Now, 4.4 uh, uh, does look uh, like it's near the bottom of what cap rates uh, the city is uh, reporting in terms of the model. Uh, however, when you look at the overall value, uh, 445 to 482, uh, and it was reduced to 445, it doesn't seem like a successor. If you look at the last page, uh, you'll see that in 2006 is the last comment we had about uh, notable exterior alterations, the apartment block name replacing doors, windows, uh, new siding, and stucco. So uh, that was about 14 years ago they did that. Uh, almost $100,000. So um, the overall value seems to be in line uh, with uh, the previous reduction. So uh, on that basis, uh, no change was made to the property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, do you have any questions? Uh, I do, yes. So you had mentioned the previous uh, decision there, um, uh, value and cap rate that was used. Um, I'm sensing a bit of a theme. Are all of these uh, from the same hearing, perhaps? Being in the same area, all being out of the housing, were they all decided on the same date by the same panel or the same appellant? I don't know. That it could be. Uh, it might not be. I just wrote down the number. I don't have the orders themselves. Okay. But just thinking off the top of my head, if they're in the same area with the same owner, such as today, odds are they would be from the same hearing, I would imagine. Uh, so, it, it could be. I know. We don't have the data, I know, so we can't say for sure. We've got that other one. I don't think Clark's not in that area, right? And. Uh, for the clerk, they also went with five and a half. So uh, I'm not sure what data it was. Okay. Um, in terms of location and capitalization rate, etc. So the subject property being on Isabel, and here I'm looking at my aerial of the property. It's essentially um, Isabel of Notre Dame, roughly, if it's just north of the Balmoral Hotel, is that correct? That is the Balmoral that's there, is it not? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> so age and area with regard to cap rate was a consideration. So the area that it would be in, would that be considered centennial there? with regard to the capitalization rate? I believe so, yeah. So that would include all of the down, the downtown, essentially, South Broadway. Like the exchange district, yeah. Exchange, but it would it would extend down to the Assiniboine River, I believe. I believe so. Okay. Um, those are all of my questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Terrian. Oh, yeah, that cap rate seems to be unusual in the 1978 building. That's all I can say. I mean, it's not a question, it's just, I just... It's an observation. I wonder. Yeah, well, I... Yeah. It's there. Definitely, definitely. And, I mean, if we're looking at the it's overall value of the property, that's uh, what I'm mainly after. So, for instance, we... Last time around, it went from 466 to uh, 445. So if we took, and they used the five and a half cap, right? So if we, we took the 21,222 and capped it at five and a half, that would go to 385,854, which would be a heck of a lot lower than what it was decided upon in 2018, which means the net operating income presented in the 2018 hearing was a lot higher. Yeah. So um, maybe we're lower uh, than need be in regards to the net operating income. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to inspect this property. But uh, in judging this property as a whole, it, it doesn't seem that uh, an increase 
of what thirty seven thousand is excessive. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sealer. Um, I think you've answered all the questions. Thank you. I have no questions, so please proceed with your presentation. Okay. Uh, again, I would just urge caution with regard to, as you've already mentioned, making uh, any kind of a decision or assumption based on what the lift was from uh, the prior uh, decision on assessment. Uh, I guess strongly urge that you look at the information presented today, and I know that uh, obviously you do do that. Um, the subject property, obviously location is uh, an absolutely critical factor with regard to real estate, so let's look at that by pages number six and seven. The page number six is just the site aerial itself, so it shows the immediate property um, <clears throat> fronting on Isabel. Better indicator, and perhaps slightly too far out, but the aerial shown on page number seven, you can see the location uh, of the property fronting on Isabel, essentially at Notre Dame, just slightly north of there. Now, if you... <clears throat> have traveled uh, up Isabel or down Notre Dame, you'll be familiar with that area. Again, as noted, the Balmoral Hotel, uh, essentially a, a beverage hotel, is located uh, almost immediately south of this on, I guess it would be the southeast corner of Isabel and uh, Notre Dame there. Okay. Is that where that Canadian Tire was around there? Canadian Tire is a little further south where it's... Or it's worse now. Yeah, so okay. we're slightly north of that. Okay, that's, sorry. That's sorry the, to Balmoral. It. the Balmoral is yeah, right there um, in between. In any case, that's, that's one establishment. The area itself is uh, uh, certainly got its socioeconomic uh, challenges if you go slightly south. On uh, Isabel, which becomes Balmoral, uh, Mr. Barakas and I have had uh, another. Um, Another uh, multifamily property located on the east side that has very significant uh, drug challenges, uh, etc. That's simply a, a function of the area that uh, it's located in. We're not far from Central Park here. It's uh, it's a tough area. Now, balancing that, we have property built in. Well, this one was built in '78. Uh, you have a very standard six two-bedroom units. Uh, they are uh, they are uh, fairly typical Manitoba housing, from what I understand. Uh, there was money put into some windows, etc., going back in time to 2006. So that has been done. Um, let's move on to the valuation itself now. Um, if you're, uh, if you're a tenant on the marketplace looking for uh, a place to stay and this is one of your options, uh, fronting on Isabel, uh, all other things being equal, you're probably less, <coughs> you, you would likely uh, certainly uh, take into account where, where it's located with regard to what you would be willing to pay. And if you have other options, you may select those. So that has a function on rent. Obviously, we feel that the rent applied to the property is appropriate, so whether the NOI was higher last time or not, I think we're at a level that is indicative of where, these, where this property is and what it is at 682 a month. Vacancy rate of 3%, uh, again, right in line with what uh, it says in that, in that marketplace itself. Two bedrooms actually in Centennial are at 4.3. Now, Centennial is a very large area. <clears throat> and uh, takes into account uh, essentially all of downtown, extending south down Main Street to Assiniboine. So we have all of South Broadway there, all of the new projects that have happened downtown, extending west to Osborne and then a little bit down Broadway and up essentially to Notre Dame and cutting over to the Exchange District. So the area uh, takes into account uh, a lot of properties that would be significantly better located and better properties than the subject itself would be. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we're only looking at six units here. 
um, and they are two bedroom units. So while there are downsides, that's certainly uh, of a size that is going to attract investors. So in recognition of that, we've applied a five and a quarter percent cap rate to the net operating income of $21,222, which gives us our final market value of $404,000. And again, that is in recognition of uh, the number of units uh, uh, and the overall uh, number of units and the type of units, uh, et cetera, and uh, the draw that that would have on the marketplace. So that is my presentation, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Barakas. Any questions? Um, just on page four and five. Do you uh, get to go in any of the units? I just don't see any interior pictures. We unfortunately could not find the time to inspect the interior of this property in the very, very tight window of time that we were uh, provided to do so. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Terrian. Yeah, I'm trying to get my head around your cap. Um, five and a half versus all the requests for six. You, you did say it's a tough area. Mm -hmm. Socio socioeconomic challenges. Um, 1978 building. And uh, you're still defending the five and a quarter while you defended the six on the others. I know you've tried to explain that a smaller unit would attract investors and so on, but I'm having a bit of a challenge on that one. Sure. Uh, so I'll just, I guess, uh, provide some an overview, essentially. So uh, six two-bedroom units. This is this is very small property in terms of multifamily. It's verging towards the, you know, the duplexes or the under four units that uh, <coughs> that uh, are on the marketplace. The uh, investors that are out there for these, uh, there is a vast, significantly more of them, and you get a lot of people that uh, are not astute investors and not necessarily uh, uh, owners of multiple properties, etc. That think, well, you know, it's four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars. That's that's a house I can I can invest in that, right? Whether they have the background in it or not. So there's. But your pool of investors is a lot more, which creates more demand. It depresses the cap rates, etc. So the area, it's exactly as described. Um, but you are going to draw the interest simply because of uh, the, the size of the investment uh, itself. Okay. Thank you. Is this a wood construction building? Is this wood construction? It is. It is wood construction. Yes. In here and location. This uh, this is north of uh, A Street. It is yes. North. That's north uh, east of Isabel. Uh, it would be on the west side. Of Isabel. West side of Isabel. Yeah. West side of Street. Okay. That's all the questions I have. I'm sure. Thank you very much. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next property is 855 Irby Street. Okay. Uh, file number 19-1746. Will uh, number 1306 uh, 148550085 Irby Street. Uh, MHRC. Uh, we've got this one. Uh, so it's at 482,000, 1978. Uh, last go around, it was reduced from 466 to 445, 5.5 cap. Uh, again, like the other uh, property, uh, we are agreeing in regards to net operating income. Now it looks like our net operating income is actually exactly the same as it was for the last property. Uh, we're at uh, four and a half uh, on this one, or rather 4.4 .4 cap as per age area uh, and 
size. So, uh, in terms of the breakdown on page three, we've got six uh, two bedroom units. Uh, again, average one is assigned 618.2, uh, 4.4 cap on page nine. Uh, just shows uh, permit 2006. Was the last property we placed in the doors, windows, new siding, uh, stucco for uh, 97,293. Uh, highly similar to the last property. Uh, that's my minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Any questions? I have no questions. And Mr. Terry, have any questions? No questions. Mr. Silan. Yes, sir. Uh, based on the permit on page nine, uh, that's what I have in regards to work that's been done. I haven't had a chance to uh, inspect this property. Yeah. That's all my Thank you. I have no questions. So, Mr. Smith, please proceed with your presentation. Okay. Uh, just to start with, I am going to make an adjustment to my value for uh, this property and uh, <clears throat> as far as the market value. Um, and uh, my final market value is 404000 for uh, this property as well. Uh, looking at property that we were just looking at, uh, I do certainly see the similarity between them. Looking at uh, this property, uh, again, built in 1978, six two-bedroom units, it's in, uh, <clears throat> in the same area, uh, located a little further west. Uh, there has been uh, some updating to some of the interiors here, as you can see from uh, uh, a few of the photographs, um, it hasn't gone through a full refresh or anything of that nature, but there has been some updating. Uh, I will point out, and I think this is not specific to this property, but if you look at the permit from 2006, uh, where they replaced the doors, windows, siding, and stucco, and then you look at my page number seven, uh, so that's your exterior door and your exterior stucco, etc. So that's just an indication of Manitoba housing and the wear and tear that they undergo. So uh, I'm not saying that they're all falling apart, but you can replace it. It's whether it stays in that condition or not necessarily. Now, the subject property and the prior one are very similar um, <coughs> and uh, indeed uh, we do recognize that, so the adjustment that I am making here is uh, a change to the cap rate from 5.75% to 5.25% in recognition of the size uh, of the property uh, and demand for it. So this generates our final market value of $404,000. So you said 5.25, the same cap. That's correct. Right. And that is my presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Barakas. Uh, no questions. Okay, Mr. Terrian. No questions. Thank you. And Mr. Silan. No questions. Okay, and I have no questions. We will move on. Just please give me one minute to make a couple notes because that one went very quickly. <laughs> Please proceed when you're ready. Okay. Uh, 
Call number 19-1650. Roll number 120319 uh, 6700 115 Clark Street. Uh, another MHRC property. Uh, roll year 2020. Assessed for uh, $2,984,000. Uh, last go around, uh, it was reduced <coughs> all the way down from $3,963,000 to uh, $2,723,000. And they used the 5.5 uh, uh, cap on that. Um, that was a uh, recommendation uh, uh, based on lowering the income quality of the poor uh, to reflect the comparable rents in the area and to take uh, into account uh, that the property is non sober housing. Um, it wasn't appealed in previous years, uh, so we were able to catch it and lower it and the board went with our rec. <coughs> Uh, which included a 5.5% cap. Uh, with uh, it at poor, it uh, generated lower rents and expenses going on a go forward basis. Uh, so you'll see uh, that it didn't get kicked right back up, which is why we're at uh, 2,984,000. You'll see on page 3, 21 bachelors, uh, 29 one bedroom units. <coughs> the property is located uh, Clark Street, uh, which is uh, just off of River, uh, just beyond it's the first cross street on the south side, uh, just past Donald, uh, on that one way that goes towards Osborne Village. Just in regards to the area, because we're looking at a different area. So uh, we have a 5.3 cap rate uh, age area and size on this property. Uh, we're similar in terms of the net operating income, but we're not exactly the same. Uh, it looks like uh, we're the same in terms of the rental income, but we just have a little bit of a difference in terms of vacancy rate uh, model generated. Uh, 1.8 uh, vacancy rate as applied to the properties in this area, uh, expense ratio, and the average monthly rent of 6.22 uh, is generated by the model. And we do have this at the lowest setting uh, to reflect that it is on HRC. So on page five, you see our rental comps. I'm not going to spend too much time on because uh, we agree on the overall income set and the vacancy uh, rate. So there's just some comps in the area which uh, show properties uh, of the same, uh, roughly the same vintage uh, bachelor and one bedrooms. Uh, Three four do have a component of two bedrooms, but their average monthly rents are higher, which would make sense because they earn more rent that way. Uh, we have the CMAC chart as well, uh, which shows that we're well below what the average, the weighted average rent would be if we just looked at it like as an average property, which again we're not uh, doing. So, uh, I did, didn't have any recent permits, but there's a photo of the property, the last page of my brief, just taken off of our Google Maps uh, here, just giving you an idea what the outside looks like. We haven't inspected it. Uh, so, uh, just to recap, uh, 2.7, 2.3, and 18 to 2.9, 8.4, uh, these 5.5 last time were 5.3 this time, so we're pretty close to what we were last time, uh, last go around. That's my list, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Uh, again, just regarding that decision, uh, do we know if that was uh, the same hearing uh, as all the other ones we've been discussing? Well, I don't know. Actually, I don't. Let me check. All I have is when the note was written. Uh, they were.
They're written on different days by different assessors, but we don't always do them right after, depending on time, so we, I can't say what uh, hearing it is from. Okay. Um, that, uh, that's my only question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Terrian. No question. Mr. Sealand. No questions. Thank you. And I have no questions, so Mr. Smith, please proceed with your presentation. All right, uh, so we are dealing with 115 Clark Street, uh, property originally built in 1959. It is Manitoba housing owned and operated, and uh, I can tell us there for you. Let's look at the photos beginning on page four, uh, or on the front cover. Um, it, uh, it's a more conventional split of units. Uh, you can see the masonry construction of it and the somewhat institutional nature of the, uh, of the interior is obviously a concrete block and uh, very standard tile flooring. The interiors uh, are um, generally dated. It's not all 1959 vintage, obviously, but you can see, the uh, again, the tile flooring, uh, baseboard heaps, uh, the bathroom at the top of page six and bottom, but then you can see some updated cabinetry in the one photo at the bottom of uh, page number seven there with regard to the kitchen. Um, top of page seven is uh, a fairly standard bedroom size for uh, these properties. So again, there is a reason that the rental level is set where it is with regard to these properties. Uh, not simply that they're natural housing, so it should have lower numbers. It's because of what the properties, uh, what the properties are themselves. So, the site is shown on page number eight. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, if you look at the, the site itself, I'm not entirely sure how many stalls they have there, but, but it would certainly be under 50 uh, in terms of parking stalls on site. Um, so your, <coughs> your uh, average tenant on the marketplace uh, is, uh, is generally looking for a parking stall. Not all the time, obviously, but it does have an impact uh, with regard to value and attractiveness of it. The location is shown on page number nine. It's as indicated already. Looking at the valuation, um, we are in agreement with regard to the rent level. The vacancy rate uh, for the subject, so if we look at <coughs> Um, on page number 13 and vacancy, uh, this falls within what, what's called the Fort Rouge area, I guess. So we have an overall vacancy rate of 2.5% for Fort Rouge, one bedrooms at 2.7, two bedrooms at 2.6. We've used a 2.6% vacancy rate. This is consistent with the data here as well as the prior properties that we were looking at uh, in general. The expenses, uh, we've given you a three-year history of the expenses for the property, stabilized them for the valuation year, and <clears throat> the expenses themselves ranged between 244 and 266,000. We've stabilized them at 229,000, reducing the R&M to uh, an average of 1,500 a suite, including a 5% property management fee and we come to a stabilized amount of 229,131. Now, if we were to use this in our valuation, it would generate an artificially low market value for the property in our opinion. So we have not done so, and <clears throat> we've elected to uh, go with uh, the city's estimate of uh, the expense allowance for the subject property now. An error was made on the calculation for this on my page number 17, and the actual dollar figure was used rather than the expense uh, allowance amount itself. So I've revised this. If you can flip forward to my page 17, uh, if you use the 56.86% expense allowance, it gives us percentage, uh, the actual dollar figure comes to 206.668, <clears throat> which gives us a net operating income of $156,981. Now, 
The subject property itself has a more conventional unit mix. It is in a better location uh, in uh, the Fort Rouge uh, East Osborne Village area there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we have uh, reflected this in the selection of the capital capitalization rate for the subject property. So we're using a cap rate of 5.75% for the subject. And this gives us our final market value of $2,730,000, up from the two six ninety nine dollars that's that's shown on the chart there. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Uh, Smith? Yeah, uh, just on page seven. Uh, looking at there's a picture, and we have a very little bit of the kitchen here to see. Um, but it, it, from what I can see, it looks similar to the kitchens in the other properties we've seen today. Have they been finished to the same extent? No, it hasn't gone through a full refresh or anything of uh, of that nature. The kitchen itself, like I'm just talking about, like the countertop and uh, the cabinets. Like, did they replace the cabinets in there too? So that that is what I'm trying to answer. So in this particular unit that you're looking at, uh, you are seeing a newer, obviously, cabinets and countertop there. And yes, that that is mm -hmm. present. It's not that the entire building has gone through uh, a full refresh. When we go, when we get the assignments and we have 130 of these properties to see within about a month's time frame, um, we, we go and we see the number of units that we can, uh, and we get the photos that we, that we do. We can't see every individual unit, but the indication is that the property has not gone through a refresh. Mm -hmm. They just replace on an as-needed basis when things get damaged or out of uh, you know, out of a useful condition, and I think if you look at my page six, this is fairly indicative of that. In, in that you have the 1960s avocado green tiling in the, in the tub there, so they haven't gone through a refresh in uh, in the building on an overall basis. Where <coughs> where they have done refreshes, I've noted it in my uh, my reports. Those are my questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Terrian. No questions, thank you. Mr. Seelan. No questions, Mr. Chair. I have no questions either, thank you. Okay, and next we will move on to 407 Wardlaw Avenue. Okay. Uh, so we actually have uh, an agreement on this one? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I believe so. I'm, I'm going to recommend uh, 583000 uh, on for the, the 2020 uh, rule year. Last time around, it was uh, it was 566, and the time before that, it was uh, 544, uh, both with five and a quarter caps. So. Uh, that's Trevor and I spoke ahead of time, and I believe that's going to be okay. Mr. Smith? Just for clarity, that was the value that I had, had uh, suggested, is it not? It is. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And we are in agreement. Yeah. So that's 583000 Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So it's based on what? On the cap or the re is it this? I'm trying to see what you based it on. Was it a oh, revised okay. NOI or what? Well, I'm, I'm just reading the email here. Um, value is adjusted. Um, and we used a 5% cap rate on this. That's what it says in the email here. I thought the overall value was fair. I looked at history. I looked at. So, okay. I took it to consider the location. I looked at the, the pictures. We were, in terms of cap rate of 4.4, based on the pictures, I thought that uh, adjusting the cap rate, there was a backing for that. Okay, around five. 
what you used. If we use it, we're using the NOI. I don't know. I just never looked at what the appellant is saying. We used it 20, 28, 574. I want to know what you've done. Uh, cap at five gives you 571,000. I have the figures if you if you want the backup for it. We've got them. I do have them here for you if you want. To well, it's just I, you know, when there's a change of rec, mm -hmm. and it's based on what. <laughs> If you don't mind, Madam Chair, I, I think this. Can you clarify that for us? Just enough, just a figure. Said perhaps you can uh, provide it with your uh, sure. mathematical. So what uh, what we did is uh, I adjusted our rental income upward uh, to 60770 and that was inclusive of uh, uh, some subsidy money that they, uh, that they had here. It uh, essentially brings it in line with where the city's uh, rent level was at. Um, Use the 2.6% vacancy, and this gave us uh, an effective gross of 59,190. And uh, we didn't go through the brief. The expenses are very high. We didn't use those expenses. We used the city's uh, expense allowance percentage. And this gave us an expense allowance of $30,022. <coughs> and an NOI of $29,168. And being in the location that it is and the size it is in that close in Osborne Village area, uh, a cap rate of 5% would be appropriate and that gives you your 583 right that works thank you very much thank, thank you. you any other questions no i just wanted to know you were right at this recommendation mr seal no questions from me no questions for me then. Okay. so it's a wreck is it yes yeah. yeah okay okay thank you very much i will now close this hearing thank you